Fotograf Festival. 27. září až 3. listopadu v Praze. Tak, uh, dobrý odpoledne, uh, good afternoon. Jménem Fotograf Festivalu bych vás chtěla přivítat na letošní první uh, diskuzi, diskuzním panelu uh, v rámci festivalu Fotograf Festival Eye in the Sky, což je téma letošního roku. Uh, I would like to invite you on behalf of Fotograf Festival on the first discussion, discussion panel uh, of Fotograf Festival Eye in the Sky. And I would like to thank especially to our guests who uh, came for the discussion and uh, to Sabrina Apitz, who will be the moderator of the discussion, then the group EEEFFF, to Zina and Nikolai, to Studio Parallel Practice, uh, Michal, Michal Landa and Jan Brosch, and to Meta Haven and the present member of the group, Daniel van der Welden. And Uh, skip to check uh, before I give word to Sabrina Apitz, the moderator of this. Sorry, this wasn't check. Uh, předtím, než předám slovo Sabrině Apitz, moderátorce uh, diskuze, ještě bych vás chtěla pozvat na otevření fotograf galerii uh, na novém místě v Jungmanově ulici číslo 7, kde proběhne takový uh, méně oficiální zahájení festivalu a současně se tam bude konat uh, křest v časopisu fotograf a bude to vlastně preview galerie, kde potom bude následovat další výstava v rámci festivalu Fotograf. Uh, so I would like to invite you after the discussion around uh, half past seven to Fotograf Gallery will be the official opening and the preview of Fotograf Gallery and the launch of the Fotograf magazine. A úplně nakonec uh, bych moc ráda poděkovala všem, kdo nám s festivalem pomáhali a pomáhají a také tedy našim partnerům, a velké díky do celému týmu Fotograf Festivalu za spoustu práce. Takže díky moc. A I will pass the word to Sabrina Apitz. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and welcome all of you. I'm really happy to see so many faces here. Um, my name is Sabrina Apitz, as Teresa already said, and um, I'm a journalist and moderator myself and a curator and also performing artist. But I will tell you a little bit more about my background also later, because we thought that would be nice to see why I have also an interest to be here, even on your place I could be. So, yes, um, referring to what, what was the description of the whole uh, event here, the discussion was um, that we mingle here to talk about the image. And it is this image which is uh, blurring um, the possibility of distinguishing the so-called real world and virtual world. And that this one shifts the question of the plausibility of a photograph um, even further. This is what was written. And we find that kind of digital images full of uh, pixels nowadays in, in advertisements, in, um, in campaigns. We also have them proving the content of online articles. Um, we find them also in digital records um, archived for security um, purposes. And it is a bit easier nowadays to edit them, uh, even manipulate than his uh, or their former analog um, colleagues. And um, as you can see, we invited some um, artists here, also designers, activists. We will present them later, and they, are them, they also themselves. Um, but not just artists, but also them. They are working with that kind of images nowadays. And um, what, what is the what they do combinations also between um, photographs and uh, graphic design. And what we as an audience receive then, perceive is, Um, the the image of or the idea of s there is something an an actual message or a real research or uh, a kind of survey. So we take it kind of for real, and this is why we are here together. We want to talk about questions like um, how to manipulate the contemporary uh, virtual reality, 
and also why it is maybe could be important to let yourself be fooled by the same techniques um, at the um, as the advertising industry is using. Um, but we will also talk about um, digital utopias, I think. We will talk about maybe science fiction narratives and maybe also emotional excesses. So this is just to tease a little bit what we will talk about after the presentations. Um, yeah, and we will discuss that with our guests here, as you can see. Um, we have, um, as Teresa already mentioned, there is um, Dina Chuk, Dina Chuk and uh, Nikolai Spesevsev, <laughs> not so easy, from the uh, Russian artist duo EEEFFF. Then we have uh, Daniel van der Felden, one of the two members of Meta Haven, the De Dutch um, group. And here on my right side for your left is Jan Brosch and Michael Landa. Um, they run the Czech experimental and graphic studio parallel practice. And yesterday we talked a little bit during the dinner that uh, there is often, and I'm already talking quite long, um, people like this introducing part of discussions and they do not check that they are talking longer than their guests. We want to avoid that and so we thought we start with a little presentations by our guests themselves. So they will present themselves and uh, tell a bit about their recent projects, their approaches, maybe also some future planning. Yeah, so we will have the three discussions here, uh, presentations, and then finally also my brief presentation. And um, I thought we start with um, the artists. They had probably the longest way to arrive here, I would say. So it is E-E-E-F-F-F, -E -E Dina and... Um, and Nikolai, just a few words about you. You call yourself independent artists, researchers, activists um, that explores technology's impact on human, on a human, and also technology's way how to hack the present day to find ways for alternative tomorrow, which is quite interesting. And they use artistic practices, but combine them also with computer science with economics, science fiction, and they also create software and hardware hacks and tools. Yeah, they participated already in some known exhibitions like the Work Hard, Play Hard in Minsk or also the, in the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe. But now, today, they are here and I'm really happy to, to listen to you. Thank you, Sabrina, for such kind of good uh, introduction yeah and um, I would like to say that uh, during our short uh, presentation we would like to uh, focus uh, on, on the main themes in our uh, work like terms or sentences and um, it will be uh, the question about digital infrastructure in our culture now and the politics of uh, resources in that and of course the future of uh, IT worker yeah and uh, fictional scenarios about uh, around that yeah and uh, like uh, we are based in Moscow and Minsk uh, in Russia and in Belarus uh, both and uh, we have like uh, backgrounds uh, Nikolai uh, has a background of computer scientist and artist and I have a background of science fiction writer and um, artist as well and researcher so uh, we would start uh, with um, a web application uh, that uh, we have created um, that kind of develops um, the fictional scenario and discloses the Norwegian Kirkenes teenagers uh, black market that they have organized. So uh, this is like the speculative uh, financial instrument that allows um, the participants of this community to sell their future goals to search investments for their desires and uh, to trade on derivatives of their dreams. So uh, this is uh, basically the platform that is based on a blockchain technology that is a decentralized technology that is developing right now. Um, and it was developed by us uh, one year ago. Uh, and probably later we somehow 
uh, would love to develop um, the changes and uh, kind of um, the um, the changes inside of um, um, the um, how the things go within those decentralized technologies, how they're developing, um, like and um, like uh, how kind of um, those applications are forming right now, and how we can play with them. Yeah, and our interest is the, um, the economical real underneath this um, hype of uh, blockchain technologies and this uh, contradiction between the rhetoric of uh, the creators of uh, such kind of technologies, like uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, the creator of uh, Ethereum blockchain, could say in some interviews, uh, and the uh, uh, economical real based on the um, uh, trading markets and you could see that all your automation uh, uh, processes yeah or eco ecologists involving the non-human uh, programmed actors yeah, inside these blockchain uh, technologies could be could become not useful in one day or in one night uh, because of uh, changing the um, the ratios of exchanging the, for example, Ethereum to, Bitco uh, to Bitcoin, and your transaction could uh, increase in uh, in value for in price uh, ten times in an hour. So these effects of uh, instability and uh, and. Uh, unpredictable behavior of uh, these ecologies are went very interesting for us. Yeah, it's also like the question of those inhuman speeds that are right now integrated uh, inside of um, like those new types of technologies that are developing and like uh, this interaction uh, that uh, Nikolai has mentioned between like uh, human and non-human actors inside of uh, those applications and to like be more concrete uh, also would love to show like a small uh, promo that uh, was created by uh, teenagers uh, this is like a fictional story of uh, why they are trading this market and uh, during this uh, project we uh mentioned to use the former bank as a place, as a fictional um, market uh, place for teenagers where they can uh, organize a kind of a hackathon or um, meeting point uh, to um, empower this uh, black market of the desires. And this economical real underneath these blockchain technologies is the question about um, digital infrastructures, which could be immaterial as a, um, uh, blockchain trading, or it could be material if we are talking about this smart city uh, uh, infrastructure, yeah, which is. Um, uh, cables, data centers, and this uh, computational power, which is concentrated uh, in the in the clusters and special places in, uh, inside uh, of the city or outside. 
and uh, we have uh, made uh, a picnic near a data center uh, in Moscow um, like two years ago and um, yeah um, we chose the biggest infrastructural center uh, of this type um, and like uh, because afterwards we've been also doing the uh, like uh, kind of expedition um, like from data centers to techno future um, and we were researching like the um, um, kind of connections between different types of uh, such kind of computational infrastructures like data centers or um, like computer science um, um, departments uh, inside of uh, and startup incubators in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, we have created a kind of a map um, and uh, like uh, here uh, within this um, like um, strategy of sitting near a data center uh, like for eight hours um, and or even eating eating yeah um, and uh, kind of this um, a preparation of uh, this kind of building and trying to uh, get this feeling of new uh, kind of la landscape um, that's what uh, we were trying to develop and um, also, like the main thing is uh, that kind of uh, well, um, uh, we were uh, wanted to raise is those participants or actors um, that determine the direction of the development of technology right now. Um, those uh, as IT workers, and we were also trying like to to communicate uh, with them uh, during our picnic. Um, yeah. And um, we also pose a question of um, like resources, who own the resources to enter uh, those types uh, of buildings, like uh, for what purposes are they entering it? Because uh, like there were, um, maybe later uh, we can focus on some more concrete stories. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, would you like to add anything? I think uh, your speech was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, like to um, kind of um, uh, we wanted uh, fr from one side to uh, talk about these uh, infrastructural uh, things uh, like here watch service in their natural habitat and um, kind of to, to develop uh, like to, to look underneath the technologies that are right now developing like uh, to to see this level of materiality inside of them yep. yeah and the question is uh, how we can deal with these uh special places in the city like a non-human non-places so which can be called uh in a physical way how we uh, behave with them with our bodies yeah, because it's uh they are built not for our um Dramas. It's not. Uh, it's for uh, different purpose. Uh, it's for non-human speeds. Yeah, and the uh, flannerin through the borderline between uh, these human and non-human uh, sectors of the this city mega structure, as uh, Moscow is, uh, the feeling of this. Um, flickering between uh, human humanity and non-humanity and uh, the possibilities of uh, our body as a tools uh, to uh, which could be used as a uh, working tool uh, with these uh, structures yeah but it, there's also like a question of um, like um, who is in at the center like uh, we wanted uh, somehow to create this scenario uh, that the city is not developed uh, like for a human like it can be developed like for machines or in human species uh, so this is also like um, th how the cities are developing right now yeah but maybe we can focus on that a bit later um, the next one is um, yep. you want? Uh, the next project is the project uh, tool, yeah, uh, which was developed uh, in a collaboration with Valery uh, Fetisov. Uh, and the aim of this project is um, to stand on the position of uh, corporation, 
with, uh, and start uh, collecting data from the people as corporation usually do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a kind of um, social psychology experiment uh, in the form of a mobile application, as you can see here, and actually an algorithm of users' interaction. So, um, and basically, uh, like the project is based on the fear of losing privacy, um, and uh, you are invited to um, like explore this fear voluntarily. Uh, by joining this community of individuals that uh, potentially being followed by uh, everyone else uh, themselves. So, uh, yeah, to do that, uh, this app uh, leaks your uh, geolocation continuously and sends it to all other users uh, inside of this application. Uh, and uh, also the um, main part uh, of it uh, is the terms uh, and conditions that you agree on um, uh, while installing your uh, applications uh, on your devices. And uh, we kind of, um, yeah, here you can see it's quite large, but not big enough, because uh, we had, uh, usually we are printing this like in a large scale, uh, so that you can read the whole uh, terms and conditions while agreeing, because uh, the app is really radical and it's collect like every data. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. we can show the next. Yeah, and um, we also tried to invest the logic of um, the situation where all data is hidden from our eyes, and it's, it's. I think, it, for example, in Russia, it's impossible to get the, uh, user data from the uh, corporations or companies uh, who who is collecting our data, uh, and. Um, the, uh, this video is the um, documentation of our um, the so-called control center where you can go and see all um, data visualized on these uh, screens in real time, for which is uh, leaking from people who are uh, using uh, the application uh, right now. Yeah, and like um, inside of uh, the small city in Moss in Norway, uh, we realized uh, this, um, like we have hired a helicopter uh, to watch the participants of this application and we were following them um, like uh, in terms of uh, like from above. Uh, and as it was uh, like a really tiny city, uh, it, it worked on a city scale uh, so that like, um, that, like this fear, it can be lost or hide it anywhere. So it really like um, goes within this creating the scenario that you kind of uh, are not, well are not having or do not feel that in in a radical form. So and we wanted to create like this um, radical experience. Uh, and yeah, and like the last uh, thing that we would like to show is like. Um, like a funny um, tutorial uh, that we're having. Uh, it's called uh, Cat Scout. Uh, and uh, this is um, like the series of like uh, videos uh, that demonstrate how to train your pet at home to get into a restricted area. And uh, the one that we will show you uh, is using the headquarter of Lubyanka. It's like a federal um, security service as a case study.
кошек невозможно заставить что-то сделать силой. Лучший способ тренировки – это игра. По результатам упражнения кошка скал должна обучиться проникать на территорию охраняемого объекта и возвращаться к вам обратно. Thanks. Thank you, Lina and uh, Nikolai. Uh, we just keep on going with the second presentation uh, by Daniel van der Felden. Um, just a short introduction. We <laughs> We also have to switch some cables here. Um, I know that you stopped calling uh, yourself a design studio and said, oh, I, heard, I heard it in one of your speeches, you leave, you leave it to other people to define who you are. So let's say um, Meta Haven is a politically minded design, research and art based collective or agency. Uh, based in Amsterdam, founded in 2007 by Vinka Krug and Daniel. Um, they are working between communication, aesthetics and politics. And they are also, as graphic designers, challenging the usual relationship between uh, the client and the designer. And um, I think Daniel will say something about it. They have written uh, a string of books um, that explore the politics of graphic design and visual propaganda, including one of the, the I think it was the first one, uh, Uncorporate Identity. And then the later one, Black Transparency, the right to know in the age of mass surveillance. And they also worked um, in different projects with the subject of, um, of what we are talking today. One is, um, for example, WikiLeaks, they uh, work for them. They work for an electronic musician, uh, Holly Herndon. Herndon? And also for a project, Sealand, it was called, an offshore micronation, which played an iconic role as a data haven, haven during the dot-com boom. Yeah, um, just one more sentence. Meta Haven is showing um, their work, uh, Information Skies, in the Futura Center of um, Contemporary Art. Um, I guess most of you have um, seen it yesterday in the opening. Uh, of the exhibition Truth Futurism, but I think you will also mention something about it. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina, and thanks for coming. It's a huge honor uh, for us to be present in Prague. Um, Prague happened to be the first city that I ever went to outside of, let's say, the Netherlands. <laughs> so it was that's an, it, that I have a long kind of um, interest in the city as well, and we are very thankful to Futura, to Photograph Magazine, to Jan Kartoffel, the curator. And of course, to our fellow panelists as well, who we all really admire as artists and designers. So I want to uh, basically just take you quickly through a kind of survey of uh, our interests. Uh, as uh, Sabrina mentioned, we are trained as graphic designers, but graphic design is not uh, the final container of our work, and it never actually really has been. Uh, it's just that graphic design has to undergo a transition from something that is actually always looking outside for the questions that are asked to it to, to a discipline that also itself can ask questions. And I guess that's something that we kind of like, wherever you stand in a graphic design spectrum, uh, and every position in that spectrum is actually really okay, uh, you can, we can kind of all agree that we're better off when we can ask our own questions. Um, so, you know, when, with, with regards to technology, uh, you know, we come from a place where we had really naive understanding about what technology is and what it does. Um, you know, as recently as 2010 in the UK elections, uh, it was actually the conservatives who were uh, singing the praises of Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, etc., as social media and kind of new forms of social organization, which they used as a way to massively cut public resources. So the embrace of technology as a tool for progressive change is really not the simple thing that it seems to be when we're sort of glossing over these issues. Um, and for us, the main question is not even always about these sort of um, social or political uh, effects, but also about the emotional effects. What, how do we talk about the lives that we're actually living within this technological megastructure? 
uh, you know, so these are some images from the work we're doing with Holly Herndon. Uh, as Sabrina mentioned, electronic musician who is interested in a lot of the same questions as we are, and we are, we are um, actually she's one of our biggest um, inspiration sources. Um, and this question of emotion is not a sentimental question. It's not about um, showing um, deprived children or other, you know, forms of suffering that, that are, you know, to, to, uh, part of the contemporary world. It's really about uh, how does technology uh, interfere and interact and how, do, how are we as inhabitants, how, how can we perceive ourselves as inhabitants of this kind of technological megastructure. And our answers to these are, for example, music videos. Uh, this is an example from Holly Hernan's song, Interference. Um, and it's quite, inter it's quite important that the answers are also visual, that they're not just research, that they're not just critique, but that there are visual answers. And this is a kind of permanent search. And we also know that no one has you know, all the right answers to these kinds of questions, of course. Um, but it seems to us, uh, it seemed to us at some point that the amount of uh, analysis that we're doing and the amount of evidence that we're getting presented about this technological condition is huge. But actually, the question that we never ask is how does it, you know, how do we, how do we feel in these changes? How do we feel in these conditions? Um, so someone else who we work with uh, regularly is Benjamin Breton. Um, and he is actually one of the more interesting analysts of this, uh, what he calls a uh, megastructure of uh, planetary scale computation. And these are all vocabularies that are slowly but surely re replacing, uh, you know, words like globalization and, and words like the internet. You know, all those old terms are being overwritten by new terminologies and new concepts. Uh, and there is a lot of map makers in this, in this megastructure. There's a lot of uh, you know, architects who, who describe how this structure looks and what it will be like, etc. But as I try to express, we try to look at it from the from the from the perspective of the inhabitant. Uh, part of this is also a program running at Stroka Institute in Moscow, the New Normal, um, which you know uh, actually uh, is a kind of cumulative assembly and clash of totalities both pre and post existing. I'm not gonna completely unpack what that means, but it, when you are familiar with the new normal, it, it means it's more or less clear, I guess. And the work of, of Benjamin around the stack uh, is also important there. And the stack is one of the model, is one of the propositions, one of the models for this kind of like vast technological infrastructure. And within this, uh, within this infrastructure, one thing that interests us particularly is the question of propaganda, which has come back um, in a quite forceful way in recent years, uh, um, um, basically referring to uh, new manifestations of state power in the geopolitical arena, and on the other hand, new manifestations of kind of artistic, social, visual power and n distribution uh, based on social media. And how is this impacting um, geopolitics in a way? And we can see this as a function of, on the one hand, the state, but also on the other hand, as a function of this planetary scale computational infrastructure, leading us to a sort of epistemological battle or a battle about knowledge or a battle about what is the, our base to acquire knowledge about, about the world. So one of the most important parts of the new normal is how simply and quickly it becomes the normal. Um, so this is a question that we are researching through a number of trajectories, um, uh, and one of them is a, a film um, which I will show or try to show a few uh, like short clips, uh, The Sprawl, Propaganda About Propaganda, which was our first feature or longer documentary film. Uh, we started by doing music videos, then you know became interested in making longer films and also short films, Information Skies is one of them, etc. Uh, and the question that came out of that whole trajectory is basically the question of complex belonging. What does it mean to live together in this new reality? That for us is the central question that we want to pursue uh, in our work. So the Sprawl um, is a web project as well as a, a feature length film as well as an uh, installation. These are screenshots from the website sprawl.space which you can all visit and it's basically an interface for a YouTube channel. 
uh, and a lot of what we do is concerned with interface and with how you know different things overlay each other. So we're re really interested in this idea of um, structure, but structure as this kind of new pop in a way, a new a new uh, ex a new pop that is at the same time propaganda and is also quite seductive, but it's also dangerous. Um, so the sprawl has a kind of it has a uh, it was created in 2016. Uh, and it exists in these various forms, forms and iterations. So we, we're, we're, as Sabrina said, we, we're not necessarily, we're trying to get away from graphic design per, per se. This does not mean that it becomes then automatically cinema. There's a lot of forms in between that you can use. You know, you can think about uh, art spaces also as a context or online spaces as new contexts to actually experience longer films. Um, so cinema is slowly uh, losing the monopoly on this idea of, of watching kind of long film or interacting with um, content in that way. So I wanted to try see and try because this film is actually quite dark and it means that here almost nothing is left of Peter Momorantsev who sits here to explain about propaganda, which uh, you know ideologically speaking maybe is an asset. The propaganda was about persuading. So this is the Chelyabinsk meteorite passing by, by the way. I'll just comment on what he's saying. Jacques Lou, who wrote the class of study of propaganda in the 1960s, French philosopher, called it mass persuasion. He didn't see propaganda as good or bad. He said it was a part of modern society, part of technological society, part of mass industrialized society. Okay, I think it's actually a little bit too dark, so I want to continue, go, keep it going, etc., because you can't really see a lot. Um, uh, within the, the sprawl, one of the uh, most important um, questions that we stumbled upon uh, was formulated by uh, Tolstoy uh, in um, 1897 in his essay, What is Art? Um, which was a provocative and highly necessary assessment of the question that is the title. Um, and in his appreciation, uh, Tolstoy, in his book, for folk art, ritual art, peasant songs, etc., and in his denunciation of Wagner and Shakespeare, Tolstoy sets himself an impossible task and trapping himself and the readers in contradictions, but his search for the honest and irrepressible core of the art expression is one that really inspires us. And we, we found it important to bring this question, what is art, in connection with propaganda. Actually, the wolf, the, the narrator, did not need to uh, 
you know, actually have the incomparable wolf, if he invented the incomparable wolf uh, and narrated it in such a way that we would, we would feel like we encountered it, like we would feel the truthfulness of the narration, it would still be hard. Uh, that's one of the points that Tolstoy makes uh, in, in the essay. Anyway, so within this, um, uh, within the film we've represented or talked about the megastructure as a sort of upside down highway. На улицах города я не больше, чем призрак. Я обитаю в мегаструктуре. Я привязана к небесам, подвешена вверх ногами в неопределенности, без конца и начала. So for this film, we found it important to inhabit propaganda, to not be adults who are constructing the message, etc., but to become more kind of one with it, to, like, uh, to make a film that's actually propaganda about propaganda. So organically, uh, the sprawl led to uh, a short film called Information Skies, in which we, uh, which is shown at Futura right now, and it has the same protagonist, um, um, Georgina David. So we found it interesting that uh, when you see both films together, uh, actually she comes back in a completely different role. Uh, as a, so she's wielding the sword and watching the screen in the sprawl, and now she's coming back uh, in this kind of. Um, uh, strange narrative. Um, so I'm actually not going to show a clip from from that. Uh, also, in the interest of time and our other other friends who are going to present, I wanted to just basically kind of fast forward a little bit to where this you know development is leading us. Um, and you know, going over. So there's also an interest in anime and anime as a sort of um, international style of uh, that in which you can project a lot of emotion. Uh, an anime, interestingly, was developed as an animation style to save money. It was meant to compete with the uh, Japanese, it was a Japanese, of course, uh, style, post-war Japan, uh, trying to compete with American animation. And there, one of the solutions was to kind of save money and have only few parts of the um, image actually move, which, uh, and it led to this kind of like style in which you have this huge emotional projection possibility. Uh, another film, Possessed, uh, currently in post-production and editing. Uh, it's a, also a longer film, semi-documentary. Um, and our first film in scope format. Um, but what I actually wanted to read you guys was um, our latest script for a film called Hometown, which we've just shot in Kiev and before that in Beirut. And I'm going to end with that because I think it's, it's an attempt to highlight what, what this emotional remainder within the infrastructure is about. So this will be a few pages. It will, won't be too long. I promise that. And then um, this is sort of the baseline expression on the level of script of what we try to put in our work. Hometown. In a tiny village, as small as four countries, well connected without phone or network, not one ship is mooring to the aerodrome. In this town, world famous and known by nobody, lives a retired woman aged five or six who isn't me unless you insist. Here's our epic, don't worry, it's short. It's a secret that everybody has heard. Before we continue, let us agree on the time. Station clock, always reliable, wrongly says it's noon, made out of one and two. So let us agree, it's three. We grew up with this, the semblance, probabilities, unlikelihood, revolving doors and mirroring walls, favors, bread, milk, sugar, self-made clothes, self-made currency, prayers for peace, almost inaudible. Grandfather is a scientist. When he picks me up from school and I'm wearing the blue jumper, he says it's red. He holds in his hands my hands, counts the fingers on each. How many? 
he draws a caterpillar, says, it is a butterfly instead. How so, granddad, you're only joking. When it rains, the sun must shine. Overcast again, daytime, syntax error, laughed, solved. The sun is hiding in moonless blue. Here is where we disagree, where one and one makes three, because I say so, because it's me. But when one and one makes three because the law says so, that's not me, says who? And is such a so-called law that different from a law that says that one and one makes two? Wasn't me or me. Actually, while here, I wasn't born in my hometown. Now, under the gaze of the satellites, between the nodes connected underground, overground, a crime was committed. A caterpillar got murdered in cold blood, dark purple, ink-like. We grew up with the seeming probabilities, unlikelihood, revolving doors and mirroring walls, many-sided coins, the coming and going of helicopters from here and to there, the TV news, a printing press, was forced to close its doors. After school, in my hands, the melting ice cream drips. Once frozen, the glacier now unleashed taste of fruit, the orchard of our ancient soil, and data center heat, you choose. Sunrise simulation, nightfall prepaid. I didn't kill the caterpillar. It was I who killed the caterpillar. Never, not intentionally. My hometown. To a forgotten city forever remembered on the very top of the deepest valley, to this place snow covered in the blistering warmth, I return feeling fresh after a long, hard journey. I return to where I never lived before. The station clock came to a standstill. It's always the same hour. Let's agree on a place. After thinking for long, I had the idea right away. I see you at dawn where the road splits in two. Someone jumping on a road split in Beirut. I was hit by the shrapnel. It also hit the ideological shell, the neighboring town, crumbling like sand cake. Our new tomorrow is like the blackbird song, a solemn voice, a silent pulse of tomorrow. As inheritance, seriously, I got the future of the ruins. Now in the sunken city, look around. People dwell, lost and entranced. They forgot about how children taught them what cannot be taught a dawn of morality from within, the children whose names speak, Luca of light, Nadezhda of waiting, Alyosha of help. United we are in chaos. Once frozen, the solid mass, now a river, becomes our life and washes away the memory banks of the town. Pay cut or power cut, there is no choice. Nightfall, a free-for-all, wireless magic, unleashing vertical fire my hometown. Thank you. In the meanwhile, I try to introduce you. Uh, Parallel Practice is a studio based on collaboration between graphic designer Michael Lander and uh, the artist Jan Bros. Uh, it was created in 2013 and the idea behind it is, um, behind this experimental studio is to find pathways between the applied and the free, but also between the commercial and the cultural. So the identity of Futura Center for Contemporary Art here in Prague has become the first and backbone collaboration project. They also have some other projects and I think they will present a few of them to us. So I give you the microphone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I, would like to uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, we are really humbled to share stage with uh, you, with Gina, Nikolai, and Daniel. 
MetaHaven has been a great inspiration for us uh, for the past few years. So yeah, uh, now we would like to introduce uh, our our project of identity for Futura, which many of us, uh, many of you, know. I'm sure. Okay. So <coughs> the first, we would like to invite you for the two shows that opened just uh, yesterday. The group show called the Ripple Effect, which is sort of spin of of Chlopetsky Award, and of course, Meta Haven's Truth Futurism. We are always doing a poster and invi invitations for the shows in Futura, and we are trying to sort of interpret the projects, the artist work, etc. So with these two new ones, uh, we. Especially in a, in a case of MetaHaven, we had a sort of hard time to find out the motive because we are such admirers of their work. So we were looking for sort of how, how to even approach it. And in the end, we end up with something which you can see in the middle. It's a poster with E and with a typeset set in a Myriad Pro, which is sort of corporate typeface which was pretty much used by companies like Apple, etc. And uh, yeah, so the theme behind this image in the middle was sort of similar to one Czech graphic designer, Zdeněk Ziegler, which is sort of legend in here. Because during his period of creating posters for movies during the communism, he was often in the situation that he had no clue about the movie or about the plot of the movie and he had to create just a motive for a movie for a couple of cinemas because it was in a very limited distribution so this was also our approach like we were thinking about okay we know about meta haven pretty much a lot but we haven't seen information skies so we tried to sort of develop the motive based on isolation instead of information, which is so ubiquitous. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, as opposed to uh, our colleagues, our presentation will be pretty much about the images. Here are <laughs> uh, three three posters we did before. Uh, each of them has its uh, story, and on it, I would like to explain a little bit our approach to the Futura identity. Uh, our point is uh, not to try to literally translate the ideas of the artists, but rather to come up with our own story that stems from the same subject. And from uh, our point of view, works uh, best in relation to the promotion of the gallery. Uh, we want this uh, dichotomy or uh, like uh, cheating to become the gallery's uh, ident identity. Uh, so this poster which you see on the right side with the giant number zero was for the group show called Scattered Disc, which was dealing with the situation after Trump's inauguration and with this giant sort of revert of power. And uh, in the press release, there was written a lot about the upcoming situation and about actual inauguration. So we just took this infamous photo of like empty uh, capital square with almost nobody, and we redraw it, and also incorporated this zero number, which was a symbol for this scattered disk show. In the middle, you see a poster for a group show uh, for a show by Brut, and it's just um, showing um, Lenin and Tintin, and um, they are in the Sigmund Freud office. And so we sort of adapted this drawing, star, uh, drawing style called Lini Claire. And the last one. So the A is um, 
Yeah, we, we sort of made this poster for four shows at the same moment, and all of the shows were actually uh, done by women. And this was for the first time that we decided to put a face, artist's face on the, on the poster. It was Czech artist Romana. We were, we were uh, touching the subjects of uh, like women face on a, on a poster in the context of uh, like a feminist uh, exhibitions. Uh, when I uh, was talking about uh, inventing our own uh, stories for the exhibition, actually, uh, I think this is uh, the point where maybe our work touches the subject of this discussion when we are uh, trying to use uh, the same cheating or techniques that advertising is using in the cultural context. Uh, so yeah, that's. So then there are some overview uh, slides with a Futura. On the left side, there's a Futura entrance with a flag. In the middle, there's a sort of overview of some posters from the Czech Dan Design exhibition. And on the right side, there's a exhibition um, look into Brno Biennial, the last one. We won the prize there. This is the display of Futura posters at uh, anniversary school show because we at the time were both uh, students of uh, kind of art architecture and design here in Prague the right one uh, the one on the right side is done in a collaboration with uh, Martin Groch so and we are coming to close up of uh, one of the posters uh, yeah maybe with this we can uh, we can close the uh, Futura project uh, and we can we would like to elaborate on um, uh, this uh, specific show a little bit more uh, this is a screenshot uh, from the website of the uh, sources go dark show it was a show that uh, revolved around the subject of uh, NSA leaked uh, documents um, leaked by Edward Snowden, and uh, we n knew just then. So we, <laughs> uh, b before the show, while we were doing the poster, so we, so we tried, uh, so we decided to come up with our own motive. We did uh, like small uh, research for. Uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a stuff that was leaked, and uh, we created uh, this uh, image, which is basically a data visualization uh, of the of uh, some some data from the Prism program, which was a program of uh, like a global surveillance, and. Yeah, we, we were trying to come up with like a poetic uh, alternative to the PowerPoint presentations uh, from the NSA. Yeah. So, it, it, yeah, yeah. so the uh, motive on the poster is basically a data visualization where each branch of uh, the three stands for one of the major tech uh, companies that became part of the prison program and uh, volume uh, of the branches in space actually shows a volume of data that those companies provided and here is an uh, overview of the poster and our invitations Uh, we would like to follow up with a book because the Futura started to produce uh, also a book series called uh, Futura Books. So this is the first one we have done. It's sort of pocket book. It came up, uh, came out recently, two months ago. It's a book of Anna Daučíková, which is uh, I'm sure that some of people in the audience know her. 
she is a first uh, queer and feminist artist from Czechoslovakia in the in the early 80s she did the reverse immigration to Moscow and we were sort of pretty much involved also not only like creating a design but we were also doing a lot of editorial work on this book and we decided to approach it uh, in sort of radical way that we also edit um, a lot of elements into the photo documentary of her show at Futura. And uh, Martin Groch collaborated on this book with us with his illustrations of the shoes. So we choose the shoes to be a sort of motive for the whole section from of the images from her show at Futura because there was strong um, connection to one of her old pieces called Legs of My Mother. So this upcoming project is not Futura anymore. This is the identity for a show um, that was um, organized by our friends Apart Collective at Kunsthalle Bratislava. Uh, the show was called Possibility of Preserving and the subject of the show was the future life, um, sort of Russian cosmism um, theory, a uh, lot of speculative futuristic ideas. And the show also uh, included us. They asked us to be a part of it, to produce uh, not only the graphic materials, but also to do a piece into the show. So. The motive that we set up was a little more personal in this way. We made a shooting with Michal's son and we came up with this solution incorporating also the pictogram which is seen here on the left side on his head which demonstrated their theory. Can you say more about the pictogram? They represented sort of universality and immortal, immortality of the future people, right? Um, okay, this is, uh, we have a few uh, more projects uh, we'd like to show, but we can go through it really briefly. This is uh, the project we did with our friends who are, I think, here, uh, Robert Anza and Petr Bosak of 2017 designers. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is promotion of the new album by uh, rap artist. Possibly, I don't know. This is the final. Yeah, here's a cover and back, back cover. We. Uh, used uh, this uh, special printing process where you uh, only use uh, three colors to produce only uh, blue, green, and red to produce all, all shades you need, like shades of black and gray. Yeah. Okay, um, this is uh, the project we are now working on. It's a uh, it's a book. Uh, it's a, basically a catalog of uh, two artists, uh, Aneta Monachis and Lucia Tkachova, in uh, which uh, uh, we are trying to approach this pro uh, project in a similar way to Futura, and we are. Uh, actually building our, uh, our own story within their their work and yeah. so uh, Aneta Monachisha and Lucia Tkačeva are conceptual artists from Romania and Slovakia and they asked us to do this retrospective book about their work and 
so this sort of process of editing and pretty much engaging with uh, their work started. We are very much interested in uh, actually edited, editing their work, sort of like massively changing it. So we are not only like changing the images themselves, but we are also incorporating like a lot of our elements. So for example, this work is called Know What Nowhere Into Something Somewhere. And it's about the piece where they transfer um, my, like um, hallucinogen mushrooms into jellies, into like, they call it piss jellies. It's an old technique that uh, like shamans did use when you eat a mushroom and you sort of get rid of all the toxins and you pee out after the only hallucinogen itself in a sort of pure form and you can cook a uh, jelly out of it. But there wasn't like, there was sort of lack of um, any good documentary. So for example, this is the case where we completely recreated the piece. Like it's all done with the 3D. This is other projects from the book. Um, and it's about, I think it's called What's What? And it's about the uh, Oxford English Dictionary that they deep, dipped into the LSD and <laughs> Michal did a really beautiful series, oh, sorry, Michal did a series of the covers for this Oxford Dictionary, I think you can describe it. Uh, yeah, so uh, in, in, the, in the book uh, they, they wanted to, uh, whole chapter to be about this project, but it only provided us with <laughs> one photo. And um, they were uh, expecting that we will come up with uh, some uh, some solution uh, that will somehow interpret the the story in some interesting way. Uh, so we uh, we morphed the cover of the first we redone uh, the cover of the Oxford English, not the dictionary, and we uh, then morphed it like uh, uh, we are trying to uh, deploy some of the techniques that the, they are using in their work and it was sort of a commentary uh, on the piece. This is uh, another case of uh, the project piece documentation, which uh, relies uh, heavily on the stuff that we bring in. In this case, we uh, uh, this work is called Politics of Friendship, and in this case, artist completely um, cut it, uh, Derrida's politics of friendship into the confetti. And our approach was to show the whole book, which is visible here on spreads on the left up side. And then we sort of uh, recreated the situation because this is just a transfer into this mess of confetti and the scissors. And this is the last uh, stuff that we want to show you from this upcoming book. And it's a uh, interpretation of um, their tesseract pieces, which are made of um, bones. So in similar way to the Dauchikwa books we shown you, we completely mm, changed the environment of their installation, which is sort of futuristic kitchen, like uh, sort of 60s visionary designs. And I think that's that. Thank you very much, guys. Um, the idea was that you get an, in, an idea of what, what the artists and designers are really doing. And I think we are on a point, uh, and also as a basis for the discussion, where I make my presentation a little bit shorter, just for you to get an idea about what is my background. 
I work for an association um, which is a, uh, called Berliner Gazette. As you can see, it's uh, connected to a newspaper image. And we are a team of journalists, researchers, um, artists, and coders. Um, we analyze and test emerging, uh, emerging cultural as well as political practices. And we are non-profit and non-partisan, so not uh, independent. We are independent. And we do that for, let's say, for 15 years, we have to be published this kind of um, uh, online newspaper uh, under a Creative Commons license. And we have more than 900 contributors um, from all over the world. And uh, we are also organizing international um, conferences, editing books, and things like that. And while it is connected, the topics on uh, for us are often has have to do with digital society, how to use the internet also as a potential. Um, and uh, it was founded in 1999. And um, as I said, we are uh, turning also readers into authors uh, while inviting outsiders to, to become authors. So it's not just uh, proper journalists writing here um, on this uh, website. And um, as I mentioned, we have annual topics, and on these topics we also um, organize um, conferences. And these kind of topics are, as you can see here, for example, slow politics, where we uh, try to find this uh, slowly emerging uh, movements and initiatives coming up during the so-called crisis in Europe. And we always uh, mingle people like activists, researchers, um, and also coders, programmers together. Um, often people who come not together in, in this kind of um, a way. Um, and there are some other ones, um, also as Darkness Falls, that was a conference on theory and practice of self-empowerment in the age of digital control. We had in 2015 the Commons as a topic. Um, I do it a bit faster now. <laughs> and in 2016, the Tested Futures, so everything which is connected to borders, what are borders nowadays, and also to movement, free, mo free movement also. And um, this year we have uh, a conference with, ha well, the, the annual topic is Friendly Fire. And the conference has not taken place now, so it is a bit about, um, as you can see, conflicts have been flaring up with exceptional heat recently, but the conference and also the topic would like to explore a little bit um, how could we embrace these conflicts in order to make societies more democratic. So turn it a bit away and turn it in again away, um, around and see, see it a bit from a dis dis diff different angle. And what also happened this year, and this is also a bit connected to the topic here, is we, we are involved in, um, in working with uh, Snowden uh, disclosures from the very beginning, I would say, um, and launched, launched on the website uh, and also in books several critical interventions under the motto uh, Snowden Commons, and um, that they are intended to explore and, and expand the democratic put potential of the disclosures so that they, they get just public and common. And this is why we organized an exhibition um, of people who work with the with the, um, Snowden uh, doc documents, with the raw material in a way, and these people are artists, or they are coming from media, or they are working on an archive. And if you are interested in that, this is um, the web page. There is the exhibition uh, running in the moment. And we also launched a book, which is this one. And I want also to let it here then. Uh, a Snowden, a field guide to the Snowden files, media art archives from 2013 to 17. So there are also some artists in, like for example, Trevor Peglin, uh, but also people who worked on archives, like the, the, the guys from Cryptome, for example, um, and uh, Andrew Clement, who, who, did, um, who realized an archive on the Snowden uh, documents in Canada. Yes, um, that is more or less um, my background. I also have a background in uh, performing arts, but I think this can just 
be a short information for you. Yes, um, I would like to, to use now the time to talk uh, to our panelists and um, also already ask you to, to think about possible questions um, which are in your mind. And the first one I wanted to ask to, um, to Dina and uh, Nikolai. Just have to find them. Exactly. Ah, yeah, there it is. So uh, you haven't presented a work I've, I found, and it is called Simula uh, Simultaneous Work Sessions. Uh, I just read one sentence I found in, uh, in the description what it is about. Uh, rationalized time management of production processes is a contrast to joint silent sessions when we unite not to produce something together, but rather to help each other to overcome the accelerating communication and produce production processes reinforced by online tools. Using the same tools not for their primary functions, we are constructing together the union of non-material workers. So the idea is that you are at the same time using a tool that um, with other people online, and but you are always also mentioning um, a kind of, um, let's say, terms like digital desires or a reappropriation of strategies or even the digital utopia. I'm interested in if this work is also connected to that and um, what exactly do you mean by a digital utopia? Uh, thank you for such kind of interesting question. Yeah, and uh, the simultaneous work session uh, sessions uh, were the series of uh, Skype calls between uh, people who and everyone can uh, enjoy uh, enjoy. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> um, add yourself to this uh, and use uh, your. Um, Time, I think, yeah, into this uh, into this virtual space, yeah, and uh, make something uh, on in the computer. And uh, our idea was, um, yeah, to, to use the very common tools, which are very um, useful if you are involved into uh, different branches of knowledge knowledge production industries now, like uh, IT. Like uh, design, like um, I don't know, I don't know, uh, search opti uh, engine optimization, or in general in the startup culture, because all these spheres are under the pressure of the time, because time is money, as a uh, mainstream discourse said uh, us, yeah, and um, in these very conditions we should find the ways how we can, uh, where is the, um, the ground or the base, where we can um, fight back uh, our time or fight back our uh, vision of our own future. Yeah? And uh, as Daniel uh, said that uh, uh, this um, the digital conditions of our nowadays is a the new normal, and now we have a uh, whole generation of people who is not uh, even uh, digital natives, but uh, they are cloud natives, and um, we should uh, somehow behave with this um, uh, situation uh, emotionally, and using this uh, emotional uh, background, uh, uh, because it's used by uh, more it's mobilized by uh, startup culture in the common as a ground to produce more values and how we can use this in a positive way and uh, it provides us uh, some vision of uh, different uh, perspectives 
Uh, yeah, and also like uh, this is like a, a question of uh, redefining uh, like the horizons in general of desires, uh, and like to bend them somehow, like to to short uh, to make like a short uh, circuit um, around, and uh, kind of through those um, simultaneous work sessions, we kind of uh, wanted also. Uh, this uh, part, uh, this emotional part of like uh, of alienation in uh, uh, xeno-feminist terms, um, like to be present and um, somehow to like to draw a map or to um, uh, to connect us uh, together, like as non-materials or non-material workers. Um, yeah, so this is like. Uh, a union of um, those who work within new strategies, uh, but somehow uh, also mm, are willing to uh, redefine the um, mm, uh, the the um, the usage of uh, technology right now. Like, how can we, uh, in different terms, turn it, and how uh, can we uh, appropriate um, um, like the technologies that exist right now? Yeah, because um, yeah, uh, we're not willing like to uh, escape from from. Well, we can't actually <laughs> uh, escape from this uh, kind of uh, um, state, and um, yeah, that is why we're trying like to work within uh, the exi the existing structures and like yeah, uh, appropriate them. I don't know if you've answered. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I just continue, or if you have something burning, you can just raise your hand. Um, for Daniel, I was you were talking about um, propaganda, and um, the main question I have is uh, which role art plays in propaganda, but I think we also have to start where um, with the question, what actually do you understand uh, with propaganda? In, what is it actually for you, and uh, where is the potential also in um, in our, the connecting art and propaganda, and maybe also the danger or risk? Yeah. Sh shall we share a microphone, maybe? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, like the, the um, oh, that's a, that's a, uh, so you're asking me to define propaganda, which is very hard, obviously, because it was something that we almost forgot that existed. You know, we thought it was something that belonged to the past, etc. And I think that um, every society has a, a sort of self-image of itself that it's um, immune to um, fake or, or things that it's um, that it, that it, that we at least let me stick to the Western idea of Western society of itself. It has the idea of a sort of immunity of all the sort of evils of the past, etc. And I think that um, propaganda is uh, has to be a cons con concerted effort. So uh, propaganda is always organized, and it's <clears throat> organized to make you um, believe that you already defeated. That is propaganda. So, um, for example, during um, last Dutch elections, uh, the the political landscape in in the Netherlands is extremely fragmented. Uh, they're now trying to build a government consisting of four political parties that have a one-seat majority altogether in the parliament. Uh, and during these uh, elections, there was a you know c continuing kind of right-wing hate storm on Twitter. And if you would just plug into that uh, storm at any random moment, you have you would have the idea that you would be outnumbered by the uh, by the alt basically factions of alt-right and 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 and, and fascist, fascists. Uh, this is propaganda. So it gives uh, an impression of a uh, overwhelming force. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is also different cultural connotations to propaganda. You know, which which have to do with it, to what extent is uh, our um, cultural and emotional tropes legible to certain audiences. I want to give one concrete example. Uh, in the uh, preparations to these elections, we happen to be in contact with. Um, a guy who was closely advising a social democratic candidate. And we were showing him a number of videos from the Internet Party of Ukraine, which is a, a political party that is largely uh, um, a, a kind of orchestrated joke. And their, their main candidate is Darth Vader. So you can actually uh, vote for Darth Vader. 
uh, and the idea is that it caters to people that uh, have lost belief in politics to such an extent that they think that they hacked the system by voting for Darth, Darth Vader. But in fact, due to some mechanism, the votes to Darth Vader go to one of the existing political parties. And we were showing this stuff uh, and showing like, okay, you know, take a good look at this because first, it's amazingly made. You have a video of uh, Darth Vader stroking Cossack statues in Ukraine, which is done so cinematically uh, convincing that it's for me, it's like a work of art, but it's incredibly manipulative. Uh, and it kind of seduces you and it brings you into this kind of state where you have no idea anymore what's reality and fiction. Why not vote for Darth Vader because we're living in fiction anyway? Right, and I was showing we were showing this to this guy in order to have him understand that this is actually happening all across the political spectrum. It's not something that's limited to certain region or certain. Uh, uh, but in order to be able to read it, we need to have a uh, almost a kind of cross-cultural understanding of um, message, and um, I think that uh, you know. There, there's been tropes around like how about getting people to be re-educated about media literacy, about how to unmask, etc. But yeah, I'm not sure what the solution, I'm not sure if there is a solution to this whole issue, but it's, it's something that's on various levels connected to art and there is also a huge danger in there, obviously. Thank you. A question from the audience, maybe. Still not, yeah. Uh, like to ask, like, um, when you talk about propaganda, you talk about this kind of right wing storm, war in social media. I want to ask if uh, you see propaganda as a direct uh, strategy of an actor who wants to put out a certain idea, or it's more of like an emergent self governing um, phenomenon in our day. That's a really good question. Thank you, because the, the, the myth. Uh, about, let's say, what formerly was called the internet was that everything would be spontaneous. There is uh, huge organic grassroots energies out on the internet by which suddenly certain memes appear, etc. And I think we, we live under that sort of 2010 understanding of the internet still. But in fact, what we see with kind of research about, uh, for example, the Trump campaign, but also many other uh, phenomena in the sphere is that actually there's an, a remarkable amount of coordination, I wouldn't necessarily call it organization, but coordination between um, not so much also that everything comes from a central point, but it's just also the adapta adaptation of certain tropes, certain certain ideas, etc. So there is it, is, it is not spontaneous, it's definitely coordinated for me. Yeah, another one connected to the topic? No. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, parallel practice as a design studio, um, do you would call yourself an activist? Uh, and if not so, do you see any connection between art, uh, be between the graphic design you are doing and activism in your works? Simply put, we are not activists. We work on commissions, so uh, we don't have uh, much self-initiated uh, project. But I think, uh, in some sense, what comes closer, uh, closest to the activism is the Futura project, which, uh, in where in, in some sense what we are trying to do is uh, like popularization uh, of art even by very raw means like misinterpretation and uh, by tools of advertising. Uh, but we are doing it for this culture subject, so. Yeah. Um, I think that there's uh, definitely a sort of self-initiation in a Futura project because uh, you know the the amount of uh, time and energy we are investing in it. Um, it started as a self-initiated thing, and we basically don't get anything out of it, but posters. So <laughs> I think that there's definitely this. Um, 
stand that we are sort of a part of the activism. But in a way, when we are creating or recreating the content that we are working with, there's definitely sort of politics behind it always. So it depends on uh, actual causes. Thank you. I uh, have a question for all of you. Maybe we, we can um, think about it uh, also about the differences. I mean, I don't know if you have, I think you also have kind of still commissioned work that get some compliant clients. So the question would be um, if you all or each of you has kind of certain, let's say, maybe values or ethics uh, for whom you work, for whom you communicate, you act, and for whom maybe not, and then why. Yeah. Who wants to start? Okay, well, I mean, for, for us it was like, okay, what, who would you like to work for in terms of that would never come to you, that would never know you, that would never think about art or design as being a venue for themselves? And we tried it with Sealand, WikiLeaks, Independent Diplomat, IMI in Iceland, and with uh, most recently with Sea Shepherd. And I can say that 80% of these efforts failed in terms of uh, establishing a productive relationship. Uh, so actually, I really, m really met the parallel practice guys in terms of like, uh, don't, don't for feel forced to become like, you know, an activist. It was only that there is still a knowledge gap between uh, certain, uh, you know, design and art fields that would love to engage with the world and the certain organizations that simply would not look for those resources that they actually do have uh, in order to find like a kind of like joint sphere of action. And we tried to bridge that gap from uh, our perspective uh, and made mistakes during, as well, of course, uh, in doing so. Um, <clears throat> maybe there were necessary mistakes sometimes, but we became more and more convinced that uh, you should tell your own story and that can become an act and an action and activism as well. But you can n not presuppose anymore that you're going to mediate what another story, another person's story into a new story. Yeah, um, so, um, like, as uh, we're mainly based in Moscow um, and uh, also in Minsk, we're somehow trying to create our own context and um, together with uh, our artistic practices, we're also uh, like organizing uh, different uh, events, like for example the event uh, Work Hard, Play Hard that is taking place in Minsk um, and that is dedicated actually to like labor, uh, new changes in labor structure and together uh, with um, the technological input um, that we call kind of transmission and um, so like for us, it's a kind of a difficult question because uh, mainly um, uh, in, in Moscow uh, and in Minsk, uh, there are not so many places where you can actually make commissions. So <laughs> uh, I would say um, you, you kind of like uh, our strategy is to be self-organized and kind of like to create like our own ecosystem where uh, we can be uh, um, like um, like an independent uh, group um, that um, yeah so uh, we make uh, like different events in Moscow and in Minsk ourselves uh, like trying to find some grants or without any money that often happens um, yeah so that is basically um, uh, for us is a bit uh, controversial topic because um, the the system that we are based in is works differently. Like there is um, not such a question. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, usually people don't pose uh, this question so much. So, uh, yeah, uh, our answer would be like that: uh, we work for for our, no, uh, our own uh, own context, um, and yeah, cr creating that. Yep. Yeah, in your in your situation, I, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, first you are doing your own stuff, but but then also your background in Russia and also the 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 censorship which is going on there. Is there um, also some some other strategies you have to um, to do what you want to do or to to show and present? 
Uh, as we mainly work in, in uh, such kind of, as we call it, gray zones uh, that are not recognized uh, as uh, like, um, I don't know, like politically, um, th yeah, that's also um, kind of that, um, like our actions uh, uh, that uh, we're mainly doing I in Moscow and uh, like uh, um, our initiatives, uh, they're kind of, um, <laughs> I don't know, on another uh, layer um, inside of uh, the whole system. So. Um, we are also collaborating uh, with uh, some activists um, and um, with different structures uh, inside of those cities. But, um, like I would say, uh, that um, like um, the, this new vision uh, on uh, like computational processes, it's not well. It's it's just becoming. Um, uh, like it's coming to the to the power structures as uh, for th that is we're uh, also somehow trying to problematize as for example like um, blockchain technologies that are right now uh, really high speedly developing but uh, they can be developed like in any uh, direction um, so what we are trying to do is uh, we also can I don't know m uh, make a presentation um, in inside of a hackathon, uh, but with um, like our own um, um, vision of how it can, uh, uh, like those technologies can be developed. Um, but this is recognized mainly as a kind of um, like speculations or interventions inside of um, um, this uh, system. But yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> so I don't know. It can be called as a strategy of uh, like accelerating things that we have and like using them in order like to make um, like to, to make our own vision uh, visible. Thank you. Um, I try to open up the panel again to you. To you. Any questions? I also ask my panelists, because it's also up to you. If you I do have actually a question yeah. and, and a comment also, which is that, uh, that I'm a little bit hesitant about the sort of fetishization of activism on behalf of, let's say, panel culture. Let's say that uh, the, 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 the mechanism by which we assume that uh, because uh, our friends here f uh, working in Russia, they must encounter a lot of s censorship and then therefore you know, this is actually, I find it like a kind of almost a fallacy of the West to think like that, to project the kind of need for a political change always on the outside where there is supposedly less freedom, etc. You know, I would wish that the Netherlands had 1% of the energy that's, that's present in Russia in terms of like activism. Because, you know, the fact that you live in a formally free speech system does not mean that the thing that's necessary to be said is also expressed as activism is an expression of that. And I also think that activism, you know, you cannot, you know, you're not an activist to sit on panels on activism. You're an activist to change things. And you want to change things if your lived reality is <clears throat> unlivable or hard to live in. So I, I think we need to make these connections more between the lived reality and the need for what expression and what action is going on. Um, and I think in terms of when we talk about activism in technology, there's a risk of it becoming this sort of huge abstract force that's there that we only can talk about in terms of like overpowering schemes like the NSA, like the cloud, like, uh, you know, surveillance and stuff like that. So what I see in, in your work, for example, is uh, what I find very interesting about it is the kind of homemade quality of some of the solutions. The idea that the solution could start with your cat for example, and that's not the low cat. That was so that, that I found really interesting. It's not nothing to do with this kind of like internet humor going viral, although it definitely maybe had a humorous effect on the audience. But this idea of where where is the solution or where is the activism coming from? Where is it crafted? Where does it originate from? I think those are those are the interesting questions in the connection between activism and art. Yeah. Was not a critique, but no, no. But I, t I, I totally agree. Uh, but it, it wasn't meant like that. I mean, it, w the first question was was for all of you, and then we came up with the activism part. Um, any other questions from you?
not now. Then I also wanted to ask you all, and maybe start um, with you, Daniel, um, who is influencing you or what uh, is inf influencing your work? Uh, we could, you mentioned already, or I read it also in an um, interview, Tarkovsky, Andrei Tarkovsky, which I found quite interesting. Mm. Maybe you can pl explain a little bit um, why he or his um, approach, his um, technique is, in, is so important for your work. Um, okay, that, that can either turn into a very short answer or like a long <laughs> story about, about like as long as a Tarkovsky film almost. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's two things really. I think it's one, for one, one reason is that um, in our work we are interested in working with different textures in, in, in moving image, such as the combination between, let's say, cinematic image and digital video, for example. So we're interested in taking the cinema out of the cinema and bringing it into another realm, in a sense. And I think one of the things that, that, that occurred to us was that we both, Vinka and me, uh, developed a YouTube addiction at some point, meaning that we were sitting ver for very, very, very long uh, behind YouTube, uh, where also the entire body of work of Tarkovsky has been posted by Most Film, by the way, so if you want to watch it, go ahead, uh, it's great. Uh, and we started to notice that actually the way we do, that we are enmeshed in duration online, in the very duration of time, has a cinematic component that we have not looked at or talked about. So we are interested in Tarkovsky, you know, he is the kind of celebrated, most important uh, Russian filmmaker, uh, arguably, but he is also a digital artist for us. And this is also to do with the way in which, if you look at his work more closely, how patchy it was. Like, it, we, we imagine this kind of perfect image, like a kind of Christopher Nolan who comes in, I know what I want to do, now I'm going to do it, and then meanwhile posing for a fashion shoot. This is not what Tarkovsky was. Tarkovsky was someone who was on a search, right? And in this search, he, he often, things went wrong. And then he did it again, where he changed his idea. He also had to work with censors, so often he had to change that he submitted a certain script, and then up to the very last minute of post-production, he kept changing the film and he kept, 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 kept working on it. So, so our thesis about Tarkovsky is much more to do with him, his kind of like the way in which we can re-appreciate him in digital culture. And of course, as, as, film, you know, as a filmmaker, he's a huge influence, but he is on many people a huge influence. But that's our particular reason. But there's tons of other people that we are inspired by. That's actually why we work. If they're still alive and we know them, that's who we work for. Thank you. Uh, what about you? Um, to come up with an idea for Futura, for example, um, how, what influences you in, in finding solutions uh, graphic design-wise? Or who? Well, uh, we are we are thinking about this uh, uh, in the context of this uh, discussion, and we thought that technology is itself is pretty important for our um, process. In a sense that uh, now it's much uh, easier to produce a lot of stuff, which gives you some uh, much more time to reflect uh, on a subject, so maybe if you compare it to uh, design which we, uh, we love from like uh, uh, six, uh, yeah, like for example international style, uh, there, there is a, a huge gap in uh, uh, or like uh, disproportion in the time that they had to spend on simply drawing things and uh, building them from the scratch. But now you can iterate uh, between many variations uh, very uh, easily and cheaply. So we are constantly trying to uh, think about how we should best spend this time. And uh, it it is, uh, sometimes leads us to uh, to the points where we feel uh, the, the work is starting to be or original in some sense. Uh, so 
The thing is that uh, what actually is less and less important is the form, and we are most uh, like we spend most of the time in the studio just thinking about like what is the motive and like what should we do, not the how. How is not the problem anymore, as described Michal in terms of technology or like you know creating some three D objects or types and whatever. But the, the problem is like finding the visions and sort of new imaginary for a new world. So we are trying to be as uh, be trying to be as innovative as possible in our studio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe there's uh, other um, other motive uh, in relation to technology, which is. Uh, that, um, for example, when we are working on the, on the book that we showed you, uh, you know, uh, mm, unmoderated and uh, factual information about this this art is, uh, you know, uh, easily accessible. So, this in the in a, on, on the internet, you know, you can you can find everything about it. So this, in a sense, uh, for us changes the role of the book itself, and we are trying to uh, find the you know new 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 meaning it, it can it can has to interpret the the, the art. Yeah. yeah, it's about sort of exclusion of that information that you wouldn't be able to find on the internet because we re-imprinted it and dedicated it to the printed book. Yep. You want to answer to that? Yep. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I would say that um, like we are into right now uh, into like science fiction scenarios. That is why like it's always changing. But uh, if if to name like the several names that would be uh, maybe Doctoral, uh, Ballard, Liam, or Mievel, uh, and like um, like to put it more concrete, uh, we are mostly right now interested uh, into the like uh, so to say science fiction of the present day, where uh, kind of. Um, like um, the question of time is um, one of the main questions, like how uh, the time works uh, within the scenario itself, within the plot, uh, within um, those protagonists that we choose uh, for our um, like for our work. Uh, we're also like uh, writing uh, some uh, science fiction essays and uh, like poems. Uh, so um, yeah, basically. Um, like uh, we're trying uh, to uh, get um, also like this idea of Ballard that uh, he was saying that he's not trying like to look uh, in one uh, thousand years and to look what can happen um, like in Mars for example but uh, rather uh, to look um, like at the present uh, like uh, as if you are already inside of the future scenario. That's what we are trying also like to uh, put inside of our practices. Yeah, and I would like to add that uh, for us it's very important to communicate and to work and to see how um, how now the emergence of um, the of works about uh, emo emotional work is uh, establishing, yeah? And it could be some theoretical work, it could be some practical things. And the importance uh, of this topic is rooted in the, the practice of uh, usual daily life in Belarus, because if, if you know that uh, in Belarus um, about between 10 uh, or, or till 20 percent of GDP in the economy is produced by um, is produced by uh, IT sector. So a lot of people involved into outsourcing schemes of producing the software. This is the, the same situation as maybe in uh, the Ukraine or something somewhere maybe in the province in the. Um, Russia, 
and uh, these um, very technicalized and very um, digitalized schemes how to produce the actually knowledge yeah uh, is uh, extended in Belarus or it is, you could see the pro pro the process of the extending these uh, production schemes from the software development to other um, uh, spheres of the economy you could find um, the advertisement in the uh, subway uh, about uh, not even about the um, educational educa uh, educational uh, classes from philosopher for example to programmer but uh, you could find the prop uh, proposition for um, uh, the business uh, not involved into software development to use uh, agile uh, methods of, of producing the uh, you know, of, of producing something like of doing the business uh, which is originated into uh, very software development yeah and uh, these uh, software development techniques how to produce uh, software how to uh, how to communicate with the clients are uh, very emotional yeah you should be very um, communicative to talk to to communicate with the team because software development now is uh, uh, it's very um, it, it, it's uh, it's about team but not about the fi uh, figure of ha uh, one hacker yeah uh, so and uh, in Belarus, you could see how these uh, highly emotional techniques are uh, now in uh, different spheres of the economy. And the question is how to how to deal with that uh, emotional level of the work of nowadays. Um, when you're talking about emotions, I'm, I'm just remembering uh, yesterday evening we were already talking about um, there is a lot of, um, if you talk about surveillance and transparency, a lot of um, visual mapping and um, showing data about the topic. Um, and we were also talking about that this is was probably, it seems, not enough to affect people uh, in terms of to... to 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 follow uh, still the topic and think about it, and I also had the feeling if we come back to to the movie, I, the film I saw yesterday, um, Information Sky, I had the feeling that um, if you if you look at it, it 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 does a little bit, and we were there already today. Uh, what cinema is doing, so um, trying to f trigger some feelings in yourself, which. Um, which is yeah a, l a little bit more than than just uh, writing the topic, and I I'm interesting in uh, interested in if this is also something you you have as an approach to um, yeah to raise the topic of um, truth or um, the situation of what what is truth actually or law. Is the question to me? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No. No. I wanted to uh, like briefly comment what, before I answer your question, real shortly, like about what you said about that you spend more time discussing, etc., less time um, only focusing on the work itself. But I, I, what I admire about your work is that we don't see that. We actually see still really visually rich work. So it doesn't seem like you're holding back, and that's good because the traditional scheme is that. Okay, I, I think a lot as a designer, so I, there's almost nothing to see because everything's here, versus you know the idea I don't think, but put everything on 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 the image. But of course, this is overcome, and it's wonderful to see that. On the other hand, I was thinking about uh, your statement about science fiction, uh, and about um, you know the the need. There's on the one hand the science fiction of the present day. On the other hand, there's the way in which you know science fiction needs or does not need to show technology in order to talk about technology. This was something that Tarkovsky encountered when, when he was filming um, 
a roadside picnic by Arkady Boris Trugatsky, the, the the novel that was the, the basis of Stalker, and in that in that uh, novel there's still some uh, kind of like outer space stuff happening basically, and together with Arkady Trugatsky, like Tarkovsky basically skipped all that layer from the film, uh, meaning that the film does not need to play its sort of main message via your identification with some sort of random gadget that might seem you know incredibly weird uh, after after like 20 years. And even it went so far as that Tarkovsky later uh, 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 regretted that he did not do the same when he filmed Solaris. Um, so I think that um, this, this thing about emotion is, is very much connected with it. Uh, meaning that what we try, of course, you cannot say that, uh, that, that information skies, some people might find it hard to understand. I, I sympathize with them. But we try to bring out something that we don't know that we feel. That's the goal. So it tries to wake up something that we hadn't realized we were feeling. And that's actually the, the, same, the same for hometown. Um, and uh, that's just what we try to do out of necessity. So this is that thing that we talked about yesterday, uh, that it cannot be said in another way than it's being said. Even though, of course, the expression is never perfect. It's always imperfect. It's always an attempt, etc. Whether that's science fiction or not, I don't know. But it seems necessary. Another try for you. I think we are coming slowly to an end. So if you have uh, any questions to one of the panelists or to all of them, would be your chance. Would be also quite nice for us here, I think, <laughs> to approach you a little bit. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who have seen the video, the film yesterday? <laughs> Nobody. Ah, a few. Any questions about it? About your experiences? You, you ha yeah. uh, I would like uh, to have a question. A question to uh, Daniel, which is basically the uh, same thing. He told about our work i would like uh, to ask how much how much uh, time for example during creating uh, uh, the corporate identity was spent uh, between think thinking and like refining the form form of it which is like incredibly intricate to us and it's it's uh, hard to imagine I think that what everyone on the table has in, has almost in, 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 in common is that we work in collective and it's now it's almost duos also so the first thing that we have to learn is how do we fight without the thing falling apart right so that's been that's been our case our main learning experience lear learning how to really disagree because people often are surprised that think and I tend to not uh, seemingly not agree on a lot of things and people are sometimes like oh what's happening but then we always eventually do agree and I, I really um, I think um, that we love to I think then the process was way more rational than it is now it has always been a kind of like very intuitive process but I think then we were much more trying to put a certain subject matter on the table and like approach it from different angles and invite also writers etc so we were trying to work through our own self-image as being rational, rational, rationally approaching the subject. And I think we've become much more um, acceptant of our own ignorance of certain topics. Some other questions? Also, if you have a question, no. I just wanted to add, uh, like, um, uh, well, not an answer, but yeah, like uh, a comment uh, um, of what uh, Daniel has uh, described um, as like uh, science fiction that is um, kind of hiding uh, the layer in order to um, like uh, actually like uh, to have it <laughs> inside. Yeah. Um, there is also like uh, the big question. So uh, we're, we're like always trying to connect like um, technologies, like uh, means basically. So um, like um, 
uh, what we find inspirational from those of, for example, um, like car crash of Ballard, uh, that um, he's actually describing a, wor a world that doesn't exist, like that is uh, the community inside of this book is united uh, by uh, like the um, car crashes that uh, all the people inside of this community uh, have been experiencing. Uh, and like uh, this is um, uh, kind of, um, and, and how actually the body connects uh, with the car and like um, this overlapping of um, um, like humanity and humanity into each other um, that uh, what like uh, we're excited about and like um, trying to bring this idea of desire of like feeling um, uh, towards um, like uh, in in also what uh, we are right now doing so um, yeah but um, like in in Moscow context I would say that to bring up like to to raise this question of uh, technological future is is also uh, well like uh, is important because um, uh, otherwise uh, it would be um, somehow caught inside of uh, this um, uh, very m mainstream startup ideology that is uh, like um, like a startup neoliberal ideology and um, yeah so for us it's also like um, double work or um, I don't know parallel practice <laughs> or um, uh, how to deal with both things because um, like it's 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 really common uh, for Moscow context not like to um, to talk about uh, feelings like inside of our art scene, but not to raise uh, some concrete issues. That is why we're trying like to uh, to develop uh, like some uh, some things um, like more material. And yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. So um, if the audience is not talking to us, maybe we talk about them. Um, maybe it's more, more for you, you, but we will see if the question about um, the role of the audience in your work. Is it a kind of um, also as a, not using, but um, kind of political medium you're trying to approach them? Um, the term of participation. So what are you yeah, approaching more or less? Uh, yeah, um, I think this notion of participation, yeah, uh, it's uh, about the um, construction of situation. So, sorry, maybe it looks like simple, but uh, it's not about the vision, it's about the being inside, yeah, and maybe learning by being, yeah, and uh, constructing the um, new types of experience. Maybe it could be now fictional one, and it could be uh, like a frame uh, in time, yeah, in the space. But um, I think it, it's interesting to behave um, in this way uh, because it produces the. Um, Maybe cultural mecha mechanical mem memory, yeah. You, you, how to say? Yeah. And uh, if we can go back to this uh, reappropriation, yeah, issue, uh, we could say that all big companies uh, which have uh, resources to um, ask special uh, special people to uh, to train their managers to behave correctly in very um, uh, stressful and uh, volatile situation yeah, of uh, the economy of nowadays. So they are doing that. So why we should escape from these scenarios? Because it's very uh, useful for them and we can reappropriate such kind of technologies because it's uh, kind of a normal now. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, and also I wanted like uh, to uh, kind of um, um, like maybe pose a question or more like a comment because um, 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 like 
um, uh, like this situation things, um, we actually work, um, maybe we can say like from, from yesterday discussion that um, like we're trying to work on, on like if to, to make some parallels um, with uh, computational systems on uh, the level of protocols that are um, invisible to um, like users um, uh, that are uh, using uh, the, uh, the uh, different uh, digital uh, web platforms. Uh, and mm, like mm, the next level or I don't know, they're somehow crossing each other uh, would be like interfaces and uh, like how to work uh, with those interfaces because um, from one side, if like to loop back to the science fiction movies or like tr literature that are not, show, um, not showing uh, the device itself or um, like the interface, like the picture as an interface, um, yeah, it's also like an interesting topic because, um, yeah, it's a kind of um, like visual layer that is available <laughs> for everyone, like for all the users inside of the system. Uh, yeah, like uh, for your, uh, your question, I would answer that uh, we work with this like uh, in invisible processes that we are trying somehow uh, to work, uh, like, yeah, to bring up uh, those protocols. Um, and uh, protocols are uh, like in, in compu uh, computational wor uh, worlds are um, kind of contracts that um, uh, are agreed beforehand how the things should work. Uh, and actually in, in like a general mean the interface is like also the same. Um, yeah, but, but vi vi uh, like visual, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, recently, I have uh, listened to to David Rudnick's lecture at Stroka Institute, and uh, I couldn't agree more on um, the thought he said. Like, the someone you work with is your client, and someone you work for is the audience. And I think that this is absolutely on point in terms of like blending all those like applied arts with. Uh, art and vice versa, and this is happening like the whole time. Like if you s look back, like 20 years ago, there was like a lot of conceptual art everywhere, like sort of post-conceptual art. And after then, there was this tendency called post-internet. A lot of people started to really care about the visuality of the work, of the craft of the work, which is given into it. And I think that now it's like more or less like super bland. That's also why we called our studio parallel practice because there is this sort of still try to bring up some new elements. So the audience is basically the one who we work for. Thank you. Then what's about you? You mentioned the venues, uh, which could be a uh, different ones. So w what would be a, an idle venue for you showing <laughs> showing information sky or? Uh, like a Guggenheim Museum or something. <laughs> no, I'm, I, no, no, this is, uh, skip, skip that, scratch that. No, I think you can make a work for an audience of one. First of all, I think that uh, you definitely work for an audience. But uh, typically for us it works like we take, we have a few people in mind that we want to show it to that should be, that are kind of our benchmark for like if they are, uh, if they love it or, or respond strongly then at least for that part we are happy or we keep them constantly in mind as, as people that we, that are important. Um, <clears throat> but with regard to, to audience, like let's say that, that I think that all three collectives here on the table cannot legitimately claim that they're um, Katy Perry or something. You know, we're all kind of like relatively obscure. So let's not over overestimate this idea about audience. But I do think that in terms of um, film world and, and, and art world, for example, there's a lot to be gained by art world on cinema versus the opposite. Because actually what we've encountered is that the film world looks incredibly down at art. When they talk about art films, they talk about films that have no plot endless duration and are incredibly boring. So there exists this huge cliche about art in the cinema world. Uh, at the same time, of course, this is because cinema cannot maintain 
the monopoly on moving image the same way that it had that it could at the beginning. So the 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 the, the primarily the idea that you can uh, watch a film or or moving image piece in a non-linear way, deciding your own position in regard to it, as opposed to sitting, like you guys are now sitting and having to watch something from beginning to end. This is actually the, the kind of audience relationship that also governs cinema's ideas about time, which are pretty much sort of Stone Age ideas about time. You know, moving now, why am I now bored, I don't accept this, etc. I go and I have to be constantly excited. And we know where this leads to. It leads to uh, kind of like end of film. So. We're interested in, in pursuing, you know, and this is also a question of online, and it's also a question of platforms. How do we create non-linear experiences for moving image? And I think with regard to online platforms, I think there's a huge challenge there, uh, because most online art video is Vimeo, actually, with a window-dressed Vimeo. So there are, no, uh, there are no platforms, for example, where the, by default, uh, there is no control over that you move your, that you can decide where on the timeline you are. You have to sort of customize that away from Vimeo in order to get that. So the future for online uh, moving image would be with new, actually new platforms, new players, new ways of playing video or, or hosting video even. Yes, thank you, that's a, that's a good point. I think uh, I also felt like um, having seen it um, at least twice and a half yesterday. So, and, and that works also. Um, last chance, I would say, for you to not forget you. So, uh, I will have a last question for, for the panel, but it is your chance to <laughs> ask something you're interested in. Okay. Um, so the the thing is that films uh, like when 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 uh, it was described about the technology being present in film or not or invisible, as you said, of course film the film itself is also an interface. So there is not that you have to depict an interface in a film in order to talk about technology. The film itself is the interface. So uh, you can be visually maximalist, maximalist, and conceptually minimalist. You can also be uh, uh, conceptually maximalist and, 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 the, and the opposite. But if uh, there was a recent study uh, which uh, found that in the US, uh, people spend two hours and 50 minutes on their smartphone every day, which is 10 minutes longer than Tarkovsky's stalker. So in fact, this whole question about attention span, I, I feel is a real fake. It's like something that we think we, we know about audience, but in fact, if you Let's say that the experience in, in, in this is a cinematic experience. Then we're watching Stalker every day in its entire length. We just don't have a concept for it. So it's a question of turning around the, the, the conceptual approach. So here is not maximalist, but it's really conceptual. How do we define duration? Do you want to add something? I think, yeah, that's uh, interesting how this duration could be uh, um, um, divided, yeah, into small pieces, yeah, and um, uh, the, the claiming that uh, we should go back and stay focused, yeah, in the long um, genres, yeah, uh, it's. Um, it is only one way how we uh, deal with um, the situation of nowadays. Otherwise, who's we can. Claiming, who's claiming that? And who's can, uh, who's claiming that we should go back? Uh, We're not claiming that, right? No. There are the different kinds of uh, forces, yeah. And someone can say, okay, th th that's uh, uh, interesting that we can play with this um, fragmentation, yeah, of our time. And uh, and how we can rearrange that because um, we should deal with that. We don't need to escape that now because uh, if we uh, escaping that, then we uh, lacking for um, reality. I think. Thank you for that comment and the question from the audience. Um, 
one last one just to close the circle uh, to our topic um, maybe and uh, if you can just uh, make it in three sentences or something it is a broad question I don't know what you do with it it's up to you where does um, reality start uh, ends for you and fiction starts um, I would say or was it for the audience <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say that we are simultaneously like uh, inside of uh, uh, reality and inside of a fiction, and it's like uh, I don't know, um, yeah, it's like a <laughs> um, merged with each other, um, and yeah, so it's like we are always inside of one and inside of another, so they are like both, <laughs> uh, I don't know, <laughs> present. Um, and like um, uh, overlaps with also time that uh, we were discussing here. Yeah, so <laughs> I would say that. Anyone else? I think uh, from my personal point of view, it's completely blended. Like, I don't know where is the where is this border? I don't think, I don't believe in this border. I think that um, Meta Haven wrote in this incorporate identity book that the border is like the graphic tool, right? To hmm. declare something. So there's no such a tool in between the reality and fiction, so it's hard to tell. I agree. <laughs> I mean, it also depends on what you consider truth. I mean, there's there's multiple words for that as well, uh, for truth. But um, let's say that that I find it hard to to see that you know. On the one hand, we talk about these topics, and on the other hand, tomorrow I'm on a plane to Amsterdam. You know, the, the others are going to Moscow, Minsk. Uh, you are going to Berlin, and this is an undeniable material reality. You know, we're not when we're trying to make our train. We're not thinking hey, let's go think about, is it actually really the, the train? Is it is it fiction that it's leaving at 5.30? No, I have to make the train. So there is always this kind of unden undeniable kind of this need for a concreteness uh, at the same time. So for me, the the, the, the fiction plays out uh, in, the, in the areas where, um, uh, okay, where, so the thing is that fiction is put under pressure by this necessity to organize to organize things and to also work on something concrete. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we know that our uh, perception of fiction and reality is dependent on where we stand in time space, space time basically. That's the so we we are working on occupying multiple positions in that spatial and time temporal relation to fiction and reality at the same time. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And the interesting question is uh, the question about the tools or operators, how we can travel from uh, reality to the fiction mm. and how we can go back yeah, and see back and see um, and uh, back, uh, backward. Yeah, and um, uh, I think now there is no, uh, not only one uh, vision of this traveling. It's not about the reality, the island of reality and the island of fiction because it's interconnected. And um, the aim of, maybe, sorry for this part of the art practices, is the uh, developing uh, such kind of uh, traveling tools. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for traveling <laughs> with you today uh, from, from reality to fiction and back and forward and back. Thank you for that. So thank you to the panelists, um, EEFFF and Metahaven. Parallel life practices and practice, and also to you as an audience and to the organizers. And at half past seven, this is quite real. <laughs> we we should all be in the Futura Gallery, I think, for the photograph gallery. It's called. Thank you. Have a nice evening.